Chapter 20. Death Threat. Tell Dr. Rosedale, next time I see him walking across the parking lot, that he's going to get a bullet in his damn head, growled a voice on the phone. Sandra gasped and spun around in her chair, half expecting to see a gunman in the back of the Oakland Medical Clinic. Who is this? What are you saying? Never mind who this is. Shit, just tell him he done somebody wrong. The front desk clerk whipped her arm through the air, eyes wide as saucers, desperate to flag down a supervisor or anyone who would take the phone call. But the man hung up. Adrenaline surging, she dropped the phone, sprung out of her chair, and twisted her ankle as she rushed through the office. Some man wants to shoot Dr. Rosedale, she said to no one and everyone at once. Ignoring the searing pain, she flung the back door open, looking for the doctor or his boxy midnight blue Chrysler sedan. The chubby center director waddled up behind Sandra, breathing hard, face pale, imagining the horror of her clinic on the evening news at the site of the latest mass shooting. Don't go out there, Sandra. Somebody call 911. She boomed, cautiously peering around her desk. The car and doctor were gone, and no strangers were lurking about. She then called the police, in accordance with the protocol, and they came and took a report. Brad had left the clinic shortly before, unaware he was being watched as he strolled to his car. He had no fear. After his latest trip to India, he operated on the belief that his spiritual awakening would keep his mission to help people safe and secure. All he had to do was his job, and it would make a positive impact on everybody he met. He was doing nothing that should send someone into a murderous rage. Not long after he arrived home, he received a phone call that changed all of that. Uh, Brad, this is Rick Short. We need to talk. Pushing and impatient, Dr. Short was the regional medical director of 25 clinics around Northern California. Somebody called the Oakland Clinic today and threatened to shoot you in the head. I need you to meet me there so we can figure this out. What's your schedule? Brad's brain reeled, thoughts freezing as though anticipating the bullet. Brad, you there? Short's staccato speech meant he had better things to do. Brad tried to think. Nothing unusual at the clinic today, but I did have a problem with a patient last week. He went into an analytical mode, which helped distance him from the death threat. This can't be happening, he thought. I always do the right thing. Oh, what's the problem? Do you remember the name? The guy started banging a wastebasket against the wall, screaming that he was in too much pain to go to work. I was able to duck around him and get through the door without getting hit. I can find his name if I look through the charts. I don't think that's your guy, said Short. If he acted out like that, he wouldn't have called a week later threatening to blow your brains out. That gentleman probably just went to another doctor. Brad grimaced at the use of gentleman, but knew that, as the director, Rick had to play the part. Uh, meet me at the clinic first thing tomorrow at 7 a.m. Now I'll be there. Brad hung up and walked around his apartment, swinging his arms like he was warming up for a gymnastics event or getting ready to fight for his life. A death threat. Somebody wanted to blow his brains out. He needed a hard drink, but he hadn't touched the stuff since his crash and burn. He settled for going to a movie at the Regal Cinema, scanning the streets and parking lots for possible gunmen, and loaded down with three packages of Reese's peanut butter cups and a quart of watermelon-flavored slush as he entered the dark theater. The fat and sugar hit his bloodstream and helped get his mind off his stalker. The movie, Sliding Doors, starring pretty and brainy Gwyneth Paltrow, proved even better. He was infatuated for every minute of the story's twists and turns. The next morning, he parked in front of a restaurant two blocks from the clinic, rolled the window down, and eyeballed the vicinity. You're not paranoid if they're really after you. A smell of fresh donuts filled the air, and the sound of passing cars made a steady rhythm. I would buy some for the clinic staff if I knew I wouldn't get a bullet in my head. He imagined stepping out of the shop with a baker's dozen, his skull exploding, blood splattering, and dripping down and mixing in with the jelly donuts. Maybe they would eat them anyway, out of respect. The macabre image made him laugh, which felt good, if only for a moment. He hadn't laughed in a long time. He called the clinic on his cell phone. Uh, good morning, Dr. Rosedale here. Is Dr. Short there? Yes, one moment, doctor. It was Sandra. Thank God you're okay. He worked the trash can scene over in his mind and tried to connect the dots. For a doctor, few things held more potential danger than stopping a patient's disability payments. Cases of going postal were real. Mass murders by disgruntled employees who lost their disability benefits and returned to get vengeance with a gun. Hey Brad, where are you? Came Rick's reply moments later. I'm in my car in front of the Black Bear Diner. Hang on, I'll send security over. Within minutes, a guy in a uniform came running and Brad opened his door. Wait, doctor, please stay in your car. The guard was almost as big as that trash can banger. 
African-American, his uniform crisp and authoritative. He had a charming sense of humor. We got to take this shit seriously, Noken, Doc. Go ahead and drive me around to the clinic, he said. This makes my day helping out a doctor who got a death threat. This shit is exciting. I'm all over it. I'm Jerry. The guard was heavily muscled and flashed a gold tooth when he grinned. He held out a hand and Brad shook it, trying to hold his own against the man's powerful grip. Jerry? Could it be the same Jerry from his childhood? His partner in crime who had found his way into a job on the right side of the law? The cocky attitude, that smile? No, this guy had to be at least 10 years younger. Brad, who was pushing 40, let go of the idea. I'm glad you're here, Officer Jerry. I don't want to go down from a bullet. It was awkward, but more words just wouldn't come out. The death threat had become very real. Brad parked in the staff lot. When Jerry gave the all clear, he escorted Brad right up to the clinic door. Go in, Doc. I'm going to take a look around. Make sure you don't come outside again unless I'm here. Brad met with Dr. Short and they went through a pile of charts and found a suspect. Then Brad got broadsided. Dr. Short blamed the death threat on Brad. You can't argue with an injured worker. They have rights and you don't. You're not the judge and the jury. You're just a doctor. If there's anything I've learned in playing this game, it's that it's not worth your safety or the safety of the clinic staff to impose what you think is justice on a patient. Just do your job, doctor. Brad burned. What the hell? I'm just a doctor playing a game? He clenched a fist below the desk and imagined breaking Dr. Short's jaw with a big right hook. He knew he could never do it. He imagined what Mo would say. There's the man again, doing what he knows best. Keeping your ass in line. Yeah, just hit that sucker. I'm going to see my patients, Brad said to his boss. He stood up. The regional director raised his eyebrows and said, right, you do that. Brad turned his back on Dr. Short and walked out, leaving him to finish his incident report. For the next two weeks, Brad arrived in the parking lot and waited for Jerry to escort him into the clinic. No action was taken to find the suspect. And a doctor who had been trying to do the right thing gave in to the pressure and lowered the bar in giving out disability benefits. Angry patients could get what they wanted. Brad Rosedale, MD, was growing wiser to the nature of healthcare in America.